The broadcast is now starting. I, I, I guess we started the broadcast. Can we it, stop? it gave me a message that had a default, and then I stopped reading and pressed the default. <laughs> So oh, yes, they may have said something along the lines of, please don't click this message, click here to click yes, right? Well, that means everybody can hear us, so good morning, Hello, everyone. everyone. Good morning. <laughs> now, knowing Jeff, having kicked around with Jeff occasionally <laughs> at some SANS events, his presentation is more than likely to be entertaining and informing at the same time because Jeff's a pretty cool guy and does some pretty cool stuff. And that's another way of me saying I didn't read Jeff's bio. Without further ado, Jeff, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, figured I'd share things as we go. Today we're going to talk about credential stuffing. Though uh, I do reserve the right to go on to tangents as we go because life is a series of tangents. Anybody can ask questions. The track two talks on the Discord, and I'll try to keep up as we go as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The coffee's in frame, Adam. Who am I? Go ahead and, and read up on it later if you like. These slides will be available. I do my own consultancy now at Rogue Valley Information Security. It's like the Black Hills Information Security of the Rogue Valley. I'm not very inventive, as it turns out. As Joff mentioned, I'm a SANS certified instructor and author of the two-day Metasploit course as well. Uh, I've made some of the prior versions of Core Net Wars. I have a problem with obtaining letters after my name. When they came from the net admin, sysadmin world, and then went into a little bit more offensive in nature. Started working for Counterhack with people that are actually on the channel right now, like Daniel Vendolino, Ron Bose. Loving it. Now I consult. But most importantly, you now know me all as the link guy. So I'll, I will happily accept my role. Thanks for that. Credential stuffing. Credential stuffing is possible because of three major points that I'll be going over. First major point, human beings are notoriously bad at generating entropy, entropy being randomness. So we only have so much precious, precious small amount of entropy in our passwords. Um, some few of us, some, choose to, I have a one pass, key pass, and last pass on screen now. Some people choose to use a password manager and only know like one or a few passwords. Unfortunately, there are still things on-premise that don't support password managers, <laughs> Active Directory for the most part. So that's, that's the first point, right? We only memorize so many passwords. If you want to chime in in the channel, how many passwords do you have memorized? Is it is it one or two or three or maybe four and maybe like two var with variations? You have the crappy, crappy password that you don't even want to bother putting near password manager like Netflix, you have the strong password for your password manager, if so, and yeah, you get some variations as necessary. All right, so that's point number one. Humans are bad at entropy. Point number two, sites get breached. We have on the right side of the screen right now, I think that way, um, a screenshot from one example, raid forums, just showing a few of fairly recent breaches. Normally these are sometimes referred to as combo lists, as in email colon password. And I have a little bit of terminal output showing on my own box some downloaded combo list, I hate the term, and a few random ones. And they're just showing the site that it came from. And then I'm showing uh, with the find command there how many different files essentially are the are different leaks. Mr. J. Heyman, it's up in the... Ah, I remember all my passwords. That's a great password. I like it. All right. Oh, George is being my link guy. Aw, I passed on the roll. All right. So uh, point number two, sites get breached. And since people have small amounts of entropy, a few passwords, because you personally use single-factor authentication, that means credential stuffing works. Now, two-factor authentication is what we're going to say. Everything needs to move to 2FA. I'm fine with 2FA. I love multiple-factor authentication, uh, like codes. I, I'm not a huge fan of SMS-based two-factor authentication, but hey, it's still like leaps and bounds above just password authentication. My pet peeve recently, though, is people essentially saying, we're moving to 2FA, and therefore, 
you can have the weak, crappy password that you also used for LinkedIn in 2011, and that's just fine. That's my pet peeve, and that's why credential stuffing is a problem. Because a lot of people think they only expose 2FA externally, but maybe it's single factor on-prem, right? You log into your Outlook Web Access with your RSA or your SMS-based two-factor authentication or your application. But I bet that every single company that's attending this or <laughs> viewing later on YouTube absolutely has single-factor authentication exposed to the outside internet as well. Because it's really easy to accidentally expose. Let's talk through a couple definitions before we continue on. So uh, I'd like to define terminology, right? Make sure we know what we're talking about. And frankly, I shouldn't give a discussion on credential stuffing if I don't define credential stuffing at some point. So first of all, we have password cracking. It's an offline attack. It means you've already compromised some box and found something that was built with a password. Commonly, this is represented as a hash, but things like curb roasting are a little bit weird in that sense. Right? That means after I've compromised your own, <laughs> you, some other box, I can take unlimited guesses as to the password. And intrinsically, the online service where I got that hash is unable to notice how many times I've attempted to crack that password. All right. Next up, we have password guessing. Password guessing is attempting to log into an online system, something that's validating your login. Now, I, I, I avoid saying online system because... Look, if you're logging into an offline Windows desktop or laptop, whatever, that's still an online attack in the sense that the authenticating system is fundamentally aware of your authentication attempt. All right, so that's password guessing. A subset, a specialized type of password guessing is password spraying, really, really commonly used once attackers get inside your environment. It's easy to forget, but half of the, the trouble of, of password guessing is the username. And any authenticated user, for one example, inside of Active Directory can dump all Active Directory usernames, and therefore somebody's going to have the password winter 2020, or if they're really forward-thinking, they might call this spring, but it's not spring yet. I'm sorry. Some places, like sunny San Diego, doesn't have seasons, so maybe the season-based uh, passwords are a little less common there. All right, so... The purpose of password spraying, by the way, is usually to avoid account lockout or minimize the risk. You can't avoid it entirely, but minimize the risk by having one or maybe a few password guesses per account. All right, so defining my actual term here, credential stuffing is password spraying, but instead of a few common passwords, I'm specifically targeting, targeting the human beings with those usernames Sorry, uh, George's comment there about coronavirus being passwords seems very likely as well. Passwords, <laughs> credential stuffing is password spraying, but targeting the human beings and their previously compromised credentials. Right, so we have, of course, the relevant XKCD, because there's always a relevant XKCD, and I'm not sure I can do a presentation at any point without referencing XKCD, but the, the right pain there, right? How hacking actually works, hey, look, Someone leaked the emails and passwords from Smash Mouth message boards. Sweet. Let's try them all on Venmo. That, that's it. Right? Credential stuffing. I mean, it's phrased as take the existing credentials and stuff them into a new authenticating source, like in this case, Venmo. But it turns out you can directly financially gain from guessing people's Venmo login. That's one example. All right. Does that make sense? Excellent. I'm seeing some nods in the room. Thank you for that. For context, I have webcams. All of your webcams joining live. I have vis visual access. I have a separate monitor over here. So thank you for nodding. All right. Sources of credentials, right? We have RAID forums. Individual unreported breaches are absolutely possible as well, right? As an attacker who compromised, yes, Smash Mouth or whatever, could absolutely reuse that combo list themselves. Special shout out for those trying to investigate credential stuffing themselves. On the right side of the screen right now, we have the collection number one through five anti-public list. That's a huge, huge list. It's 120 gigabytes, but that's compressed. It's a terabyte of collections overall. Creepy Jeff. Creepy Jeff is creepy. As far as single factor authentication sources, everyone listening to this presentation has single factor authentication exposed the outside world. I will make that bet. 
that will make that that very strongly. The classic example is having Outlook Web App with a username and a password. But even if you have two-factor authentication on Outlook Web App, Black Hills Information Security has actually done a blog posts on, it turns out, other endpoints like EWS, Exchange Web Services. Can, can someone look up real quick? BHIS, EWS, and maybe single-factor authentication? And share that link? All right, and I'll share it in the slide notes as well. And by the way, of course, I always share the slides at the end of the talk. And there's the uh, uh, speaker notes as well. Ah, thank you, Ron. All right. Office 365 login, of course, for any organization dealing with Office 365, that's extremely common. Uh, one of my personal recent favorites, notice in the lower right of the screen, 250 Auth GSS API NTLM. Many organizations still expose port 25, SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, to the outside world. Did you know that by default, Exchange supports NTLM-based authentication? As in, single factor authentication to Active Directory backed source, which is pretty ideal for credential stuffing, honestly. Now, there's other things as well, but I just wanted to show the number of results. I have a screenshot of OpenVPN. There's lots of them. I don't know how many of those are single factor authentication, but a special shout out to the lower left of the screen, that hex that I'm searching for is remote desktop being exposed to the outside world. That could be two factor authentication as well. But between these, right, we only need one single factor authentication source commonly pointing to Active Directory, but it doesn't have to be uh, in order to expose the entire organization to credential stuffing attacks from the outside world. And look, if it's Outlook Web App or I can fish one user into giving credentials, then suddenly internal phishing is so much more effective. Once I get VPN, there's always going to be single factor authentication services on premise inside the environment. Yes, there's the shout out of um, Google has Beyond Corp, right? Every, there is no special internal subnet. Everything is exposed to the outside world. I'm not saying this in a mean way. Beyond Corp misled the industry. Too many organizations that were far too small said, oh, Google is just exposing everything to the outside world. We should do that too. That seems like a great idea. And then they exposed crappy custom coded applications internal web applications that are just full of flaws, right? Web application penetration testing exists as a field to a rounding error because there are so many cr custom-coded, crappy PHP applications out there. Don't expose a small side rant, as promised, tangents are here on Beyond Corp there. All right, a couple of recent statistics. Microsoft obviously sees a lot of these credential stuffing attacks or replay. In this case, they're talking not just credential stuffing, but also password guessing overall, right? And they said 480,000 accounts were compromised by replay in just January. This was over at the uh, RSA conference this year where I hear people were exposed. Anyway, moving on. A couple of recent examples, right? We got Krebs on security, that Citrix attack recently. That again was password spraying, which, the, Yes, it might be, here's the username and winter 2020 is the, like the classic example, or in this case, maybe Citrix one exclamation point. Why did I do the one exclamation point? Two reasons. First of all, because usually eight characters is required as minimum length. Second, because one exclamation point add two other categories, so it makes it a complex password. So there's additional links in the class notes, or, sorry, <laughs> in the slide notes as well. but. One more example, right? Krebs on security, recent breaches. This stuff gets you in the door very commonly. Every presentation has to have that good old minor attack matrix. And I, I love minor attack matrix. Don't get me wrong. This is not making fun of it. I love that we have a common language to describe attacker techniques. I do think it's a little overwhelming at first. So let's take a couple of other looks. First of all, I did a, a last talk at Wild West Hacking Fest on finding malware inside your own environment. I like to talk blue and red, right? And the attacker perspective on the attack matrix is not this visual recommend, visual visualization of the attack matrix. It's from the attacker point of view. I don't know which of those techniques is actually monitored by the organization once I land inside. So on the far left of the screen, we have the initial access column. 
And what might be something like a spear phishing link, look, phishing is ridiculously prevalent. But by the way, the bottom on initial access is valid accounts, just logging in. That's credential stuffing is one possible method for that. So that's why I have the top left mine and Minesweeper already clicked upon. Because you as an attacker, once you land inside an environment, you've already potentially triggered some kind of detective control. You just don't know if you've triggered one. But you have to play the game. You have to use techniques to move laterally inside the environment. You don't know when blue is going to detect you. And very importantly, there's fog of war in both directions. People very commonly understate how long it takes an attacker to figure out what the hell is going on with the environment. Like, it is very common. Pen testers in, in the chat room, back me up here. It takes very little time, on average, for a new environment to gain something like domain admin rights or credentials, right? very privileged credentials with access to the data that is important to your client. It takes a lot more time on average to figure out where is the important data? What's what's going on in this environment? How do they have their subnets up? What is their naming scheme? All that sort of little stuff that takes even longer than getting credentials. You have to use techniques as an attacker. The mines, right, are monitor techniques. They don't necessarily kick you out immediately. I am a huge, hu uh, a huge fan of detective controls over preventative controls, but we'll get into that a little bit later. I have side rants on that one. Let's make the attack matrix a little easier to deal with, a little less overwhelming. I, I very much try to focus on accessible language to my clients, right? I want them to be able to understand, even if they're at the executive level. Side note, I heard people talking about the C-suite yesterday. Executive staff, executive personnel is more what actual executives refer to themselves as. C-suite is pretty much just what people in the lower tiers of the environment call them. So right, having the right terminology to talk to your clients is very important as well. All, pretty much every attack needs internal access because beyond corp isn't everywhere. Pretty much every attack needs some privileges, right? The same reason that you need IT to log in your computer to install whatever software or to update uh, Adobe Acrobat or whatever. Step three, finding the, that, the data that's important to your client. That takes a lot longer, as mentioned before, than clients tend to perceive. Out of all of the stuff, out of all of these four things that attackers need, I would say that step three, probably takes the longest. If the pen tester goal is to find and copy and exfiltrate some valuable data, which is one of my favorite, more common goals of a pen test. I'm a huge proponent of goal-based penetration testing, but that's not the topic of the day. Number three, finding the valuable data takes a lot longer than people think. This is why it takes a long time between initial compromise all the way to breach. Breach being you appeared, you're the headline of KrebsOnSecurity.com, and compromise being someone gained a shell internally, internal access. Internal access is inevitable. Stop them before step four. So I can map that to the attack matrix as well, because this does map pretty nicely. And this is nothing against attack. Please don't get me wrong. But I think attack is a little bit overwhelming to defenders or attackers looking at it for the first time. With internal access, of course you have some access mechanism. You have some method of code execution of your choosing. It might be Meterpreter, it might be Cobalt Strike, it might be PowerShell Empire, it might be Covenant. In fact, there's a thing on C2 Matrix. Hey, hey George, do you have a, a link to C2 Matrix handy? If you can share that in the channel, that'd be great. And I'll put it on this slide, of course. We need some kind of persistence mechanism overall, right? So if a machine reboots, you don't just lose access inside the environment overall. If there's some kind of endpoint detection and response, EDR agent like Syslon is my absolute favorite from a defender's perspective, then you might need to evade some of that where possible. But usually strong detective controls, you might not be in a position on the environment to stop those detective controls. Special shout out to Matt Toussaint, who definitely showed some pretty elite uh, hacker foo by doing things like null routes to the monitoring server. So if you have something like Sysmon, you have Windows event forwarding, you have endgame. What if I add like literally the route add command, a null route, a bad route to the endgame server? 
so it can't phone home, right? Defense evasion. So internal access implies two, three, four, five different attack matrix techniques already. We have privileges, right? Gaining privileges inside the environment. So it's classically privilege escalation, but there's also credential access. They, they have two different categories here because me gaining local administrator permissions is very different than, hey, you, you share this file share with the entire environment and, and it has a domain admin password in it or it has a, a local admin on some server where there's a domain admin logged on. I find this pattern all too commonly. All right, step three, discovery, right? Just what do I have access to now? I'm a domain admin, but of what? Right? I Please don't think I'm, I, I do tend to like getting domain admin, right? I like to be in charge of other people's environments as well, but domain admin is pretty much never necessary for any realistic attack. It is useful for pretty much every realistic attack, but it's never really necessary. If the goal is to gain access to development environment and push new code to your client's software or demonstrate the capability to do so, then look, if you fish a developer, win. Sometimes all of these things can be collapsed pretty down, uh, down pretty shortly because things like ransomware are the favorite example recently. You don't need privilege escalation if you already have access to the important data that isn't backed up. That's what ransomware is all about, because it's easier to scale, frankly, as an attacker. And then copying, exfiltrating that data. Stereotypically, this is something like an encrypted 7-zip document of all of the stuff I've staged from all over, but it depends on whatever the impact, or sometimes people refer to this as actions on objective, as in the attacker doing what they actually wanted to do. So we have internal access, but that most environments you're probably not going to land as a local admin immediately. So you need some privileges, right? Maybe local admin, maybe getting privileges in the right area. Then you figure out where the important stuff is. You walk over, you grab it. So maybe the very important thing is copies of backdoors and breaches. Available on Amazon now, right? You have to look around, find throughout your environment. I have like copies of this deck all over because look, I asked very, very nicely. So copying and stealing that data uh, once you find access to it. But looking around the environment digitally can take some time. Credential stuffing, right, often gets number one and two for free. Or very commonly, internal access via credential stuffing and privilege escalation via either credential stuffing or just password spraying. I walked in the door because um, I'm going to say Vaslo had... His email was available on the outside world. He has a LinkedIn account, and it turns out it's really easy to gain access to uh, someone's email address. And then he's already been breached because, sorry, Vaslo, but you used LinkedIn back in 2011, and your password hash was correct. Sorry, Vaslo. Checking your exposure, right? I said finding and fixing your exposure and credential stuffing. So let's uh, let's talk through the options to work with here. <laughs> Adam, this one's for you at the bottom there, right? Halo reference. We have different modes here. If you have Azure AD, easy mode is available. Please use easy mode. Azure AD has something called banned passwords list. It's amazing. Password protection, it's like a literal checkbox. It's great. Far more commonly, though, People attending this talk either live or looking at YouTube later, you may not have Azure AD. So you could just dump password hashes and use a word list of just the compromised passwords. Not doing password cracking overall, because it's unrealistic as an attacker that I can do millions of attempts per account without triggering account lockout, right? Password guessing is intrinsically different than password cracking. Hard mode, therefore, is doing real credential stuffing against single-factor authentication login sources. Look, I'll consult and do hard mode, but as a defender, why would you? Right? Absolutely take advantage of the easy on-premise access. Absolutely take advantage of the fact that you can not trigger account lockout by doing password cracking instead. So first of all, a shout out. There's the link in the slide notes as well. The on-premise password protection of Azure Look, you have to be Azure AD admin. And last time I gave a talk at Wild West Hacket Fest, I think I, I said to uh, deploy Sysmon, link it to the domain root as a group policy, just YOLO install it everywhere. 
I'm pretty much saying the same thing today. Look, if you're an Azure AD admin, click this checkbox. You can do it live. Anybody logged in as Azure AD admin right now? Just, it's a Friday. We always deploy to production on Fridays. It'll be fine. Deploy to production on Friday the 13th. That is my advice to you. Apparently, I've forgotten everything I remembered as a systems administrator. Make sure just in audit mode. Audit mode means upon password change, essentially, hit deploy button press. Excellent. Thank you, Huskerman007. All right, so audit mode doesn't actually stop people from changing their password, but enable password protection, yes. This is for your on-premise. This is not just for Azure AD. This is for on-premise as well, because in a very secure fashion, I've talked to Mark Mazowski about, Mazowski, Mark M, last name here, about it. Um, they do it in a very secure way, but they are syncing hashes from on-premise to Azure AD. But it's actually a hash of a hash, essentially. And they're comparing that hash of a hash to a banned list. It's a very, very big list. It's great. Do that. You can also remember Tim Medin was talking yesterday about hacking Dumberly. I loved it. And you have that custom, I'm pointing at my screen right now so you can all see it, of course. We have the custom banned passwords list. Why can people use summer, fall, winter, autumn, spring in their passwords? Why can people use your company name? Why can people use the word welcome in the password? That's probably not a great idea. Why can people use previously compromised credentials as their password? That's what this talk is about, fixing that problem. So if you have Azure AD, Look, there's a little bit more to deploying that agent if you don't already sync, but you probably already have Azure AD sync going on. Legendary mode. I wanted to talk through a little bit about the, the consulting side of things, right? I target individual human beings. I try to do that in a very scalable way. So I try to think, who can I give an example of that probably won't mind being in a slide as the example? And I did crop out some of the sources, the domains for email addresses for John Strand, Black Hills Information Security, owner and founder. So this is via LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn is really, really common, but I'm using specifically Rocket Reach. It's usually meant for like marketing people to look up email addresses and even phone numbers, which is terrifying. Side note, but there's a question about, is the Azure list limited to 500 entries? I believe the custom password list is, is limited, but frankly, I am far less concerned about that because that's just searching for patterns, essentially inside the password itself. All right, so for John Strand, if I knew John Strand was at my client's company, I try to look up everyone that's at my client's company, all of their corporate email addresses, because it's, look, some people do register to like LinkedIn or whatever with their corporate email address, but that's less likely than them registering with their personal email address. So one thing I'll try to do to correlate is to find for each human being at my client, what personal email addresses do they have? And have those ever been breached? If so, per each human, grab all of those prior breached passwords, and then, well, I don't want to do just those. I'll do something like um, hashcat best64.rule and only allow the password hashes that actually match complexity requirements of the target organization. And then for each user, I might have Let's say 100, account, uh, 100 passwords to guess. Let's say I'm attacking Adam Mashinchi. Sorry, Adam, you just have to deal with it. I might have a couple hundred passwords to try for Adam. Account lockout policy is usually like five bad login attempts in a half hour rotating window. So I might do one attempt per one hour per account. But there's 168 hours in a given week. I can pretty much do credential stuffing at a fairly low pace, not locking out accounts or minimizing the risk of locking out accounts all remotely and usually not causing much in the way of hassle, but I might get some valid credentials. And it usually only takes one to get inside an environment. But you don't need to do this as a defender. You don't need to do this. It's more complicated. And frankly, there's a higher risk intrinsically because password guessing, as we've just defined, is against an online authenticating system. And therefore, account lockout is always a concern. Normal difficulty. If you really want a GUI, there's a thing for this called Compromise Checker. It's in, it's in this slide right here. If you can deal with a bit of PowerShell, though, there is a PowerShell module called Match AD Hashes. I love 
PowerShell commandlet names because what does match ad hashes do? It matches verb dash noun. Match all of the Active Directory hashes to what? The previously compromised ones or whatever hash dictionary you provide. So the usage, I, I just ran this last night when I was finishing up my presentation. <laughs> Match AD hashes pointing to the user database of your organization. This is technically password cracking. You're doing compare. Well, you're still doing comparison. And then hash dictionary pointing to, in this case, have I been pwns previously compromised credentials list in NT hash format. So what does the result look like? Now I'm doing the select object dash first one. It just gives you the user or users if it's plural, how badly, uh, how common that password is. So the frequency is how many times that particular password hash has appeared. And I'm going to tell you this, this password hash that I have a D79, it's the password Mercedes. All lowercase, no complexity. This makes me very, very sad for this prior client that I was testing with this, right? So frequency being high means it's a commonly reused credential, really common pattern. Frequency being low is a stronger indicator that it might be that human being's prior password. If, look, if frequency is one, Troy Hunt and Have I Been Pwned has only seen that password once. That's not a great sign. All right, part two. So I showed you the overview, the actual commands for match AD hashes. I showed you user underscore hash dot txt. The format is just the username colon the NT hash. Notice I had the domain name on the prior slide as well. So I'm a huge fan of nice, safe, easily discussable methods of gaining password hashes with my client. I love NTDS util. There's a certain tier of trust when it comes to this binary is Microsoft signed. Can I run it on your environment? Microsoft signed it, well, go right ahead. Where do you want to run it? Which credentials, right? NTDF util is used for many things, but in this case, we're making an install from media backup. This is the right way to dump password hashes safely. You can do things like volume shadow copy or reboot a domain controller in a very special mode or DC sync with Mimikatz. But if I talk to an Active Directory admin and say, hi, I'd like to run code from Mimikatz, to dump password hashes from a domain controller by pretending to be a new domain controller inside your environment. That conversation doesn't go very well. NTDS util though, that's an easy conversation to have, right? And there you can shorten the command. Look, last time I ran this, it was literally via a interpreter shell because it turns out it's easy to get a interpreter inside of modern environments because AV evasion is trivial because AV as an industry is I stopped myself from saying fraud, but I want to have like 90% of that. Anyway, moving on. Part three. Of course, treat NTBS util files, this backup that you just created, very, very carefully. Password hashes are credentials. Password hashes are credentials. Every form of network authentication for on premise Active Directory. For Kerberos, for NTLM, for Landman Challenge Spots, for NTLM v1 and v2, they're all, thanks for George for repeating that one, they're all using the password hash as the shared secret. When you authenticate over the network via NTLM v2, via Kerberos, via WinRM, via PSExec, whatever, if you're using on prem technologies, the shared secret, the thing that you're proving access to is the password hash. So those NTDS util files, that's keys to the kingdom until everyone in the environment changes their password along with curb PGT, but I'm not going to talk about golden ticket hacks just now. So treat those files very carefully. Look, if someone already compromised the domain controller, I'm going to say this live on the webcast, you're boned. But if you're copying them elsewhere, treat that box just as importantly as a domain controller. Recommendation here, you have a process for imaging a laptop. Use a fresh image, do this password audit, and then re-image it afterwards. Good to go. So the easiest way to extract password hashes from that NTDS util backup is something called impacket, or one specific module in there called secretstump.py, but Kali installed it as impacket-secretstump. So I have the exact syntax here. It's the exact working syntax. 
Because as it turns out, the NGS YouTube will make a couple of directories wherever, as subdirectories of where you point to. So I did a C colon backslash, I'm pointing at my screen again, path to backup, and it would make two subfolders, one called Active Directory and one called Registry. The Active Directory folder is going to have a file called mts.dev. That is like the core beating heart of Active Directory itself. And those password hashes are actually technically encrypted but they're encrypted using keys that are stored in the registry. This is my favorite example of encrypted does not mean the game is over, you don't have to worry. Encrypted means where's the key. I taught at military base recently, and I was teaching normal SANS class and looked in the back of the room and like, oh, hey, look, there's a network cabinet in the back of the room, and it is locked. It meets the requirement, check, for being locked. Is it a useful lock, though? Because the follow-up question is always, well, where's the key? The key is stored in the lock. We can all agree it meets the check mark of it is <laughs> it's, it's locked, absolutely. But is it a useful lock? I think we can agree that it's a less useful lock if the key is stored physically in the lock. And yes, it was a crappy wafer lock, Ron. All right. Okay. So the impacket command, as listed there, saves out. Let's do secret stump. Let's see the dash output file. It'll save a number of files starting with secret stump. That's actually technically a prefix. Secret stump.ngs will be the domain hashes in landman nt format. So I'm saying take the first field, which is the username, and the fourth field, which is the nt hash, and save it as a file called user underscore hash.txt. That's the exact file name I mentioned before. So some people might be saying, oh gosh, Kali? I could do Kali on a VM, or you, there is Windows Substance for Linux is weird nowadays. You can have Ubuntu as just one more application with the terminal. There's also Kali, just installable from the Windows Store. We live in a weird world. Also, you can install PowerShell on FreeBSD and Mac OS and Linux now. This is a weird, weird world we live in. So, yes, the easiest way to do secret stuff from Kali, you can get impact it from like compiled binaries from Python, Pi to EXE and such, or Pi installer. I didn't want to have a recommendation in my slides for take somebody else's compiled binary, download it to your machine, and give it access to password hashes. So I decided instead to give recommendations to point to the source. Some organizations, NIST has special powers for all of the gubbies, right, the government folk in the room. Did you know NIST requires you? To rotate compromised credentials, you must force a password change if there's a known compromised credential. Well, we could, I suppose, as a strategic plan, just never, ever look to see if any of our credentials are already compromised. But uh, that seems like a little bit willful ignorance. So you kind of should, right, use NIST as your excuse to check for already compromised credentials, right? So just for some organizations, yes, the new NIST standards actually recommend no longer requiring password rotation or password expiration, except if that password is known to be compromised, which is the excuse that you needed, not the one that you deserved, in order to uh, check for already compromised credentials. It also no longer recommends password complexity because, as it turns out, people just append one or exclamation point to a capitalized word. We have the old phrase, and it's a good phrase. Prevention is ideal, but detection is a must. I wanted to have a little shout out for my new phrase, the new phrase to take away. Prevention is impossible. People will land on essentially random endpoints, maybe via credential stuffing, maybe via phishing, and that's about it. Those are the main two methods people get inside your environment. There are other methods of initial access, but it's fairly rare for realistic, real-world adversaries to show up on site with a, I don't know, USB rubber ducky, find an unintended but logged-in machine, and get their payload running via keystroke injection. That's fairly rare for realistic passwords, or realistic attacks. And my job as a penetration tester is to model real-world, realistic penetration tests. People will land on your endpoints, hopefully as a limited user. Hopefully. Let me, let me phrase it differently. Breaches are when attackers make it through steps one through four. Compromise is when they land on initial endpoint. Compromise is inevitable. You can work around it. And please, uh, I, I have a, I'll have a shout out in the, the slide notes. Hey, Ron, what's that link for social engineering payloads? Can you paste it in the chat, please? 
shout out for why can your users execute code from over email? Why? Why, why is that a lot? Like, macros are a good place to start. Don't get me wrong. Last breach I worked with, incident response, a city was ransomware because someone opened a .doc Word document with macros enabled that gained the initial code execution. But there are lots of methods of code execution that your regular users can do over email. Why? Which ones? Do you know which ones? Take a look at that, right? Prevention is impossible, but lock down the methods that, look, prevention is ideal. Sure, it's ideal, but it's also impossible. It's both those things simultaneously. Lock down the methods of code execution for regular users that you don't use inside your organization. How do you know which ones they use and don't use? You're going to have to audit. Add logging before you make sweeping changes, except for enabling Azure AD band passwords. Just YOLO, click that checkbox. Prevention is impossible, therefore, detection is a must. Thank you, Ron, for including that link. That's the end of my regular discussion. Any questions in the chat room, please bring them up as we go. Many, many thanks to Wildmost Hackenfest. I, I know it's a lot more than John Strand, so special thanks to Deb and Joff and John Strand and Jason Blanchard. I know they've had a very, very busy time putting this together. Thanks to all of you on the chat. This has been an awesome presentation to get involved with. I'm loving it. And I do have a spot for questions. And as always, my slides are online. This is literally the bit.ly link. Yes, yes. Click on my bit.ly link. Ha ha. This is literally the link to the presentation I'm giving now. Now, I'm pretty sure Joffa is supposed to end the meeting for everyone, right? That, that's going to cause us to have a good time. Please don't do that for us, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I got you back. I got you, fam.